This is Devin Foley, CEO of the Charlemagne Institute, and uh, welcome to another episode of Countdown to the Election, uh, hosted by uh, First Tuesday Conservatives and then co hosted by Alpha News and Charlemagne Institute, which is the publisher of Chronicles Magazine and Intellectual Takeout. Today, we have Chris Talgo with us and to discuss a variety of topics, including socialism, the Great Reset, all of that. He is an editor at Heritage or at Heartland Institute, excuse me, not Heritage Foundation, Heartland Institute, which is uh, based in Illinois and uh, really made a name for itself uh, fighting the global warming uh, chaos over the last uh, decade and a half or two decades, basically. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you're a lover of history. How did you end up finding yourself at Parkland Institute and in this in this world? And what motivates you? So I, I took a uh, sort of a uh, different road to uh, becoming a uh, editor here at the Heartland Institute. Um, after college, I did I studied uh, history at Indiana University, and uh, I'd say ever since I was mm -hmm. a kid, I was just fascinated by history and. Uh, politics and public policy and you know these kinds of things and um, after graduating Indiana University I worked as a teacher for uh, five years taught uh, U.S. history world history and American government and um, after five years of doing that I you know told myself I really wanted to be more involved in the uh, public policy discourse and debate and um what I decided to do was start applying to some think tanks. And it just so happens that uh, out of all the think tanks I applied to, I was offered a position at the Harlan Institute, which just so happens to be about 15 minutes from where I grew up. So I packed a U-Haul truck and I moved back to my old, uh, my old stomping grounds and uh, been here at Heartland ever since. And um, I am, really blessed and I am, you know, really happy to be on board here and I, you know, think we're doing a great job and I, you know, hope to be here for a, for a long time. That's fantastic. It is funny how people, uh, you know, there's some people that are purposeful getting into our, you know, movement, if you would, and they've, they always want to go that route. Uh, but there's a, there are a whole lot of people who sort of stumble into it in an inter, in interesting ways. And, Sounds like both you and I are, uh, are examples of that. So now, as far as the work you're doing, it looked like uh, reading some of your re recent articles, uh, you talk about uh, the challenges of socialism that we are up against. Tell us more about what you're seeing and uh, how this battle is going. I mean, we're watching essentially open Marxists uh, running for office, for instance, in Portland for the mayorship. Meanwhile, Antifa, a uh, Marxist, cultural Marxist organization um, with playing upon its Marxist roots and socialist roots, burning, looting, trashing, attacking, even killing at times uh, different people. So we definitely have a socialism problem here. Tell us more about it. So uh, here at the Heartland Institute, uh, about a year or so ago, we launched a project called the Stopping Socialism uh, Project. And uh, what we kind of saw happening was we saw this, this resurgence of socialism in the United States. And, you know, a year ago, 18 months ago, we, we thought, well, let's try to get a little bit ahead of the game here and let's try to really uh, uh, enlighten people about what socialism is really about and, and why it's so dangerous. And uh, from a personal perspective, as a uh, teacher, you know, when I was teaching world history and U.S. history, I was pretty shocked at how so many of my students who were 16, 17, 18 years old had such a glowing uh, perception of socialism. And, you know, I, I was shocked about that. And as I've become uh, more and more involved with uh, this Stopping Socialism project, I have actually become more and more astonished at how many ordinary Americans are also becoming uh, open to the idea of socialism here in the United States. And I, like you said, I think it's a very dangerous thing. I think every day it's gaining momentum. Uh, you know, Joe Biden's running on a almost socialist platform. Uh, when you look at 
what the policies are that he really is saying that he would implement uh, part of the Bernie Sanders uh, unity task force uh, recommendations plans. Um, I think it's extremely dangerous and I want to do everything I can to try to really uh, refresh people's minds about socialism has been tried so many times it's failed so many times America is a well functioning uh, constitutional republic and we should remain that way. The, you know, when you look at a lot of the polling that's out there and we've seen this on our side, uh, particularly with intellectual takeout, uh, with its large uh, social media audiences, the, it, it's fascinating in that you are right that a, a significant portion of younger Americans, you know, let's say 40 and under at this point. I mean, we were seeing this 10 years ago when the millennials were in college and some of them were even out of college. So over the last decade, uh, this has only grown. But when, you know, the polls will ask, are you favorable to socialism? And large chunks say yes. But when asked to define socialism, uh, they feel miserably. And it seems that socialism is just sort of being spread as the way of running government if you want to be nice. Uh, tell us more about what you've seen as far as do, do these Americans turning to socialism actually understand the, the philosophy of it and its outlook? Or are they, are they just kind of going along with the flow and hoping to be nice? I think you made a really great point. When you ask people what the definition of socialism is, they give you such a range of answers. Um, I've also noticed that a lot of people are now um, pointing to uh, Nordic socialism, Denmark, you know, Norway, uh, Sweden, and saying, well, they're doing socialism, therefore it's working there and we should do it here. Um, I've written extensively about how those countries are actually not socialist. They have vibrant free market economies However, those countries are like comparing apples and oranges to America. They're much smaller, they're much more homogeneous, and the people there are willing to pay high taxes. They're willing to, uh, you know, to be become part of a more communal um, society. And here in America, first of all, we're completely different. We're 330 million people. We live in a humongous um, geographic, you know, sized country. And we were founded upon such different principles. So I think that that argument that they've really tried to point to recently, especially Bernie Sanders, is not a uh, valid argument. But I also think, and I notice this a lot um, as a teacher, that a lot of the textbooks, and I also noticed this when I was in college in the early 2000s, um, it's almost been rewritten. You know, the professors in college and the you know the teachers in the high schools are trying to portray socialism as it's a good idea, but it's just never been done properly. And if we can do it properly, well, then we can change, you know, how socialism is perceived. And I strongly disagree with that. And I think that once American people really understand what socialism would mean for them, their families, that they would be adamantly opposed to it. But they're, they're sort of being sold a bill of goods. And like you said, they're, they're being sold the almost like the good parts about socialism, but they are not being told about how it's gonna impact them adversely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, it's funny when you point out, you actually go to uh, the Socialist Party of the United States and uh, things of that nature you find, they're very open and very uh, exact in their definitions of socialism. I mean, the, the public ownership of means of production, uh, the dissolution of private property and the traditional family, uh, all of these types of things. When you were out there, uh, you know, sharing what socialism actually is, and again, the great danger here is it is what I tell people is it doesn't matter that this large cohort of, you know, I've seen numbers upwards of 40 or even 45% uh, of young people have a favorable view of socialism. It doesn't matter if they don't know what it means mm. because they're still going to support people who are saying that they are running on socialist ideas. 
Those people, though, know what it means. That's that's the grave danger. Right. So how how have uh, your project at Heartland Institute been going in that? You know, do you see changes in people when you reveal uh, the actual uh, nitty gritty of, uh, of socialism and Marxism? So I, I think our, our approach, you know, over the past uh, year and a half has been to first educate people about what socialism really means and to really get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what socialism has done to, you know, some of the uh, most prosperous countries here in the 20th century and 21st century, Venezuela included. So not only are we trying to tell them, this is what it really means, this is what it means to you, but we're also trying to uh, make them understand that these people are not doing this for your good, because as, as we all know, in social societies throughout history, it's the elites who are pushing the socialist policies who are the ones who are immune from it. So if Bernie Sanders is saying he you know, is advocating socialism, but well, we should also be well aware that Bernie Sanders has a couple of homes. He's a millionaire. He's you know, done very well for himself as they're spending decades in government. Joe Biden, same thing. So I, I really think that people need to understand that these policies that they're pushing is meant to almost placate the population and almost to, for lack of a better word, enslave them you know, in some ways so that they are just pawns to this uh, political class and they are the ones who are going to really reap all the rewards of this. What would you say, uh, why is it that Americans, especially younger Americans, are so friendly towards socialism? Uh, what would you trace that to? So I think that's a really good question. And I think, you know, back to 2008, 2009, with, you know, the, uh, the Great Recession, you had a lot of kids that were coming out of college. They amassed a lot of debt. And um, I think that they have struggled over the last decade or so to really get their foot um, you know, in the, in the economy. And I, I think a lot of them, you know, especially the millennials that are more and more open to socialism are almost using that as an excuse in some ways because they're saying, well, the, the, the system didn't work for me. So therefore the system must be uh, you know, wrong and therefore we must replace the system. When I would argue, well, actually it's not the system that's the problem. It's the fact that over the past 10 years or so, we have not gone in a more free market direction. We've, you know, layered uh, the bureaucracy with, you know, regulations. Fortunately, in the last couple of years, we've started to do away with some of that stuff. And in that three year period before, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, hit you are sure we were actually moving in the right direction. So I think that they've been sold the bill of goods and especially under the Obama administration. I go back to like the life of Julia video where it's like, don't worry because no matter what happens to you, government will be there to protect you. And I think that, you know, for a lot of uh, millennials that that is enticing to them. And they, they want that, like that pseudo security that some of these politicians are pushing through their you know, socialist proposals. But then these, these millennials are not aware that that comes with the consequence. So whether it's paying super high taxes or just, just being you know, part of a, like a, a government entity where you don't have as much freedom, you don't have as much liberty, you know, they are willing to discount that for the bill of goods that's being sold to them as free college, free this, universal basic income, so on and so forth. So uh, essentially choosing security over, over freedom in yep. many ways, while thinking that uh, the security that will be provided is their means to freedom. You know, you look at some of these changes where it's, it's going from, you know, the government, your freedoms are government can't do X, Y, or Z to you. Uh, we have now shifted to, I'm not free unless I have the means and ability to do essentially what I want. And that is government's duty to provide the ability to do what I want. Uh, and that's a tough thing to fight with. You know, I don't think, I'd be curious what you're seeing out there. In my experiment, just arguing, you know, free market economics and things like that doesn't work very well against people who are having, you know, an, a, more of an emotional 
uh, desire to feel safe, that, that you have to find other arguments. What are you seeing out there? I could not agree more with your with your statement. I think it's I think it's tough for us because we're coming from an almost defensive position as we're saying they the other side, the socialists and you know the the far left, they're they're pushing policies that are concrete that people can understand. We'll give you health care. We will forgive your student loans. We will give you a universal basic income. But we're arguing a more abstract concept and it's much more difficult. We're trying to argue that, hey, if the government gets out of the way and you have freedom, then you can prosper. That is, you know, the, the way to go. But it's so much, in my opinion, and in, in, my, uh, in my discussions with so many people on, on these kinds of topics, it's much more difficult for me to um, try to make them understand that, hey, if we, had a, if we had a free market healthcare system and, you know, that operated more or less like, you know, how you buy auto insurance, that would be much better because there would be all these opportunities, there would be all these choices. But I think it's so much easier for them to just grab onto this concept that the government will provide Medicare for all and you will be taken care of. So I, I think that that's one of the things that we need to probably do a better job on and it is explaining how our almost lack of uh, you know socialist type policies will be so much better off because they will give you the opportunity to thrive and function in a free market. But it's a, yeah. it's a big lift. Well, and it doesn't help either that we exist uh, in a market that in an economy that is wildly manipulated uh, in many ways. And then, I mean, you have all of the challenges of a debt-based economy and uh, Federal Reserve policy, all of that. And then on the other side, you also have this monster of big government uh, in cahoots with big insurance. And, you know, you look at Obamacare, I was always amazed, you know, all these people rushing to the defense of Obamacare uh, who have stickers that say, you know, Citizens United must die and corporations aren't people, all of that. Fair enough. Uh, but as a, if I recall correctly, it was the big insurance agent uh, lawyers who actually wrote a good chunk of Obamacare. I, you know, this sort of corruption, it's, it's hard because I think that a lot of people are trying to argue that what we have right now is, is a true market economy, and it's not. So you got this seen versus the unseen where people see what's around them. We acknowledge, everybody acknowledges there are massive problems. But they assume that this is, uh, you know, a true free enterprise economy and that, you know, this is what it's all about. Well, they don't like that. So then socialism. Uh, uh, are you seeing people convert over as far as they're shifting away from socialism? Just just one point on what you, you know, just talked about. Um, yeah. Before. I, I think I think that's a really relevant uh, point you just made. And unfortunately, it's almost as if the discussion has become between crony capitalism and socialism. Yeah. And I think that that is, that is such a straw man argument. It's, a, it, it's, it's not true. It doesn't have to be crony capitalism, big government, or socialism. There is you know, a, a wide spectrum here. And unfortunately, the more free market approach has been discounted and it's, you know, it's been put up by the wayside. And that's, that's old fashioned. It's just not applicable in the 21st century. And I think that we, once again, just need to do a better job of, of properly articulating that. Okay. Now, switching gears a little bit, I mean, socialism is, of course, a globalist outlook on the world, ultimately, at the end of the day. But, uh, you know, you've also written about the Great Reset, and uh, Heartland has done some there. And, you know, when you initially stumble on the Great Reset, which was, there's actually a promotional video for it put out by the World Economic Forum, which is uh, the whole Davos crowd, Davos crowd. And it seems like it's complete nuttery conspiracy theory stuff, except the promotional video is sponsored by biggest, wealthiest corporations around the world, governments, all of this, and the people that are actually even speaking and, put it, and talking about the Great Reset. 
have enormous power and wealth on a global scale. And so it seems that it's a very real thing that they, that these globalist elites want to achieve. Tell me, tell us what is the Great Reset, first of all? So the Great Reset was launched a couple months ago, as you said, by the World Economic Forum. And what they're doing is that they are using COVID-19 and the uh, economic devastation that that's brought as it's, it's time to to start over. And by start over, they mean we want to implement a whole new form of uh, capitalism. I think they call it shareholder capitalism. By that, they mean that they want um, the, the workers of these companies to have more of a say in how these companies are run, also have uh, more of a share of their, uh, their stock and, and such. Um, that's just one part of it. Another other part of it is they are using this as a as a, a vehicle to implement a lot of their environmental policies. So it would be like the Green New Deal for the entire world. Um, like like you said, you know, there's a lot of uh, big names, uh, the royal family of the United Kingdom, uh, some some pretty high ranking communist uh, party officials from China, um, the World Economic Forum itself lots of corporations have signed on to this and um i think like you said it, it it's it's that new world order that they've been kind of trying to push for the past you know couple of decades and they're using covid-19 as the opportunity to do that but they're also using uh this this notion that the the, the world is hopelessly unequal the world is you know, hopelessly uh, ravaged by inequality and, and all these terrible things. And if you just give us the power, then we can fix all this. And uh, you know, as we've seen time and time again, if they can't do it in a city, let alone a country, how or why in the world could we think that they could implement this on a global scale? And so this is a very serious, uh, project, if you will, I mean, this, the ramifications of this are enormous. Uh, how do you, how do you get people willingly to go along with this on a global level? I mean, is there, are they waiting for the mother of all market crashes? Are they waiting for some natural disasters? Are they waiting for uh, a significant war to break out, and in the wreckage of all of that, they then, tr you know, try and pull a, a phoenix moment and, and bring something out of, you know, something grand out of the wreckage. Uh, tell me more. I mean, what, how do you begin to implement this sort of thing? They are really using the coronavirus pandemic as the Trojan horse to push this. And okay. what, they're, what they're saying is that the the COVID-19 pandemic has um, shown the world that the status quo does not work, whether it's economically, whether it's through their climate, you know, change uh, hysteria. They're using fear mongering. They're using fear mongering, you know, through the you know healthcare landscape, through the economic landscape, through anything that they can to say, we need to start over. We need to literally like press reset on the world and we have all this knowledge, we have all this power, and if you just give us the opportunity to sort of restructure and reorganize everything from the top down, then everything will work out happily ever after, and just trust us, just trust us, don't, don't, don't question us, and obviously I think that, you know, their argument uh, has a lot of holes in it, and um, at the uh, WEF's website, you know, they talk about what they would do, why they would do it, and I think a lot of their uh, policies that they are proposing and promoting are are shown to be, you know, just just they don't work. They've never have worked, and they never will work. However, you know, socialism and uh, and globalism has been around for a long time, and these people are using this this terrible pandemic that you know has uh, put the world at a standstill uh, for an opportunity to gain power. I really think that that's that's the the crux of what's going on here. Well, and that's something too. Uh, I think it's hard for your normal everyday American, no matter your political stripes or outlook on things, but 
it's hard for most people to understand that there are people out there who hunger the most for power, not fame, not wealth, not recognition, power. And that's a, that's a dangerous, dangerous path to go down. And some people won't stop at anything to achieve power. So you had said on the World Economic Forum's website that they list some of the policies to be able to, you know, to implement this. I mean, I imagine that all forms of government have to be shattered, broken apart. You would have to have a currency that you can completely control on a global level. Uh, and then, of course, all of the regulation and things of that nature that I imagine. So what are some of the, the major points that they want to achieve? One of them is uh, uh, global wealth redistribution. Uh, they have targeted the United States and some of the other Western countries as having too much wealth and the, quote, third world countries as being uh, you know, left behind in this. So there is a major wealth redistribution aspect of it. Um, there's also the climate change and the green uh, economy part of it, which I think is just preposterous because unless China and India are willing to get on board with that, it, it's a moot point. And already China and India have said that they will never be on board with that. So there's the uh, wealth redistribution, there's the, uh, the, the green new deal on a world scale. Um, there's all sorts of immigration uh, uh, regulations and policies that they're pushing there. Um, it's, it, it, it's across the board. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's, this, it's this almost like cabal of these extremely wealthy people. I mean, these are multi-billionaires who have this unquenchable thirst for power and they want to dictate on a worldwide scale how things should be run. And sometimes they lay it out like they do on their website about uh, you know, they want to do this, that, and the other thing. But I think a lot of it is they just want that power. They want to tell everybody this is how things are going to be from now on. And that is such a scary proposition because every single time we have entrusted a, you know, an elite um, to have that kind of power, it has not turned out well. No, that's sadly very true. And you can even see it in you know, people's work situations and life and things like that. You run into some people that, uh, you know, they do like their power. I mean, the old bureaucrat is the, uh, you know, the quintessential example, but it happens all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and so you imagine that kind of individual uh, with the with real levers of power over the entire globe. How does how does it all work? Is it, you know, it, is it just that we're, we're all going to be one in the United Nations and we, you know, we vote on these things? Is it uh, going, is, does each country have a couple of representatives that go to, I mean, how do you, how do they even plan to build this thing? So th they haven't uh, gotten to the, uh, the details of how it actually would be implemented, but I think the best way to think about it is United Nations on steroids. So yeah. you would you would have uh, you know these diplomats or whatever you want to call them from you know each country that would be on this this council and that they they would uh, I guess vote and or just decree what you know is going to happen uh, you know going forward. Um, once again, they're they're pretty light on their details, um, but if you read between the lines and if you just look and see what what they are kind of envisioning um it would be a new world order it would be uh the you know the elites of the elites uh like you said in, in davos and these you know other places who would be uh pulling the strings and sovereignty for the united states would be obliterated um you know individual freedom would be gone um i think it's extremely dangerous and no matter how they try to portray it, no matter how they say that it can be done and it can be done, you know, in a, in a fair method, whatever, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's a non-starter. 
No, it is definitely uh, a worrisome thing. For those of you who joined us perhaps a little bit late, I am here with Chris Talgo, who is an editor at the Heartland Institute. We've been talking about socialism and uh, currently are discussing the Great Reset, which again, you know, when just listening to myself speak and to you, you're just thinking, this is just a uh, nuttery, you know, con conspiracy theory, but legitimately i know people who have gone to davos and you know you have to have a significant amount of money and wealth and power and influence to be able to get invited there and uh, people pay a handsome fee for that and to have the world economic forum begin put out a promotional marketing video uh talking about the great reset and the need to to do all of this i mean it's real but it seems unbelievable, but it is very real. Yeah, and just one, one of the quick point on that. So it, it was launched last year. They had this initial meeting in which they just kind of fleshed out like the basics. Um, they were supposed to have their their workshops and like the, the big, you know, uh, next meeting in January of 2021 that has been pushed back. But, you know, they have a uh, an entire website devoted to all of the things that they are you know thinking about doing and like you said there's a lot of other big global interests who are on board with this imf uh you know world bank just all sorts of things so this is not some fringe conspiracy theory that the uh the world economic forum is you know trying to cobble together there are major interests on board with this and i think that this this has been kind of the the pattern for the past couple of decades where you know we've been moving toward this kind of more globalist you know movement whether in the united states through you know um allowing china to come into the wto or you know we could name a hundred things and i think that sometimes that can be done too much i'm not saying that we should be isolationist but i think that we should not give up our sovereignty for this um unrealistic idea that the entire globe can live under one government and we can all live in peace and harmony. I think that that's just not possible. Now, culture matters, uh, ethnicity matters, all the things that we're told uh, are made up. And, uh, you know, if you bring it up, you're a racist for it. These are all real things. And uh, it, you need to, especially as we battle with this, you have to have the courage to know who you are as a person, how you act to people all of that and treating people with dignity to be able to shield yourself from these uh, attacks on topics that need to be discussed. Uh, and so you, like me, don't see a way, uh, I don't see any way to be able to pull the entire world together into a united democracy without sh just sheer chaos. And then of course, those who pursue power uh coalescing into a couple of different factions uh and i don't think any of that's going to be any good for the bottom 80 percent of the world and a lot of people are going to find themselves in a bad place it is amazing what do you this is this seems to be just a dream that keeps just won't die to have a global order uh you know i mean when i was in high school in the 90s i heard about it and as you start to read and study history as you know i mean you can even see the hints of it at the various uh conferences of european alliances of the napoleon of all these different things uh is this just something we are always going to have to live with this temptation to have a global order, uh, technocratic, democratic, uh, global order. I think on a very superficial level, when I mean, you don't really dive into the details of it, it sounds like such a great thing. We'd have one currency. We'd all speak the same language. We'd all be on the same page in the same wavelength. But like you said earlier, the world has 7 billion people in it each continent is dramatically different. Each country is dramatically different. Each city within each country is dramatically different. I think that they, they just refuse to accept the fact that, you know, that, that there are big differences culturally, uh, you know, across the world. And for some reason, and I can't really pinpoint what their true motive is besides um, a loss for power that they want to implement their vision 
on everybody because then they would, you know, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but then they would rule the world. Yeah, and you would go down in history as the man, the first man to rule the, the entire world, uh, which is incredible. Now, out of curiosity, and this is, uh, you may not, you know, want to jump into this part of it, is there a spiritual dimension to all of this? You know, when I've watched uh, World Economic Forum meetings and certain, you know, their, their entertainment that they often pull in, it's very, it's very neo-pagan. There's this weird blend of uh, new age and the occult. And uh, this, th there is, it seems, a very spiritual dimension to it. What do you have to say to that? Is that something that uh, it almost needs to be addressed to be able to really grapple with what we're up against? Or do you see it as, well, it's there, but it's not, you know, it's not the main driver. I do, but I see just a slightly differently. So I think that okay. they're trying to remove religion from the equation mm -hmm. because for, for the vast majority of people, relig their religion is, is, is their God and it, it is their answer. And they want to say, no, religion's not the answer. Global government's the answer. We're the answer. So we want to put your religious ide like ideals aside because those, those aren't right. Don't, don't worry about those. You know, listen to us because we have the answer. And I think that also uh, is a thread throughout socialist uh, countries. You know, in China, religion is not allowed. So the union, religion is not allowed. North Korea, Kim Jong-un's the god. And I think that that's obviously purposeful because what they want to do is say there is no higher power except the government. And for the, for the you know, the World Economic Forum and for those pushing for the Great Reset, that, that's a big problem. They do not want people to have uh, religious, you know, practices that that would trump the, you know, the new world order that they're trying to implement. So they're trying to say, put that aside and just and, and, and you know, government is the one and only answer, which is, once again, I think a very scary proposition. Well, it ends up as sort of the worship of man and yeah. what we create. French Revolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was and, and, you know, as a, as a history guy, I was always amazed, I've been uh, just amazed at how little the French Revolution is covered in uh, most history classes in America. It's just sort of this, well, they tried to achieve these things, didn't go well, Napoleon took over, and then they got back on their feet as far as democracy goes and all of that, skipping over uh, the genocide that was committed in different parts of France and just the wholesale slaughter of uh, right primarily of Catholics. So, yeah, and 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 the fact that they that they tried to you know implement this this super logical you know restart. It's almost like that that in itself was like a great reset on a smaller scale because what they're saying is like you know we're just going to start over. We're going to redo the days of the week. We're going to redo everything. Yep, and and it's all going to be you know, based on, on their science or what they thought was science. Well, reason but, is as right. they saw it, which, yeah. Exactly. And, and, and like you said, they, they, they needed to make sure that, you know, the, the people who still abided by those, you know, those religious traditions, you're gone, you're done because you are not um, uh, abiding by our new, you know, our new great reasoned, uh, you know, philosophy here. And if you, chose to not buy by that well then the guillotine was waiting for you yep uh i've got one uh sort of point to clarify for folks too because the question came in uh this is not uh, it may you know have overlaps with the agenda 21 that a lot of people are worried about coming out of the united nations but the world economic forum is a completely separate entity uh, it is the annual gathering of the biggest of the big wigs uh, globally. You know, you don't, unless you have big money and big influence, you're not getting into that at all. Uh, so just for, for clarification uh, for the people that are watching or listening down the road. But, yeah. like, but like you said earlier, this I, I, I truly think and I, I agree with your assessment that in the mid to late 1990s, 
you know, we kind of saw this, this, this movement toward, you know, this like global super government, yep. whether it's Agenda 21 or the Great Reset. I, I think that unfortunately, you know, past 20 years or so that there's just been like this, this slow march towards it. And the Great Reset is just the, in my opinion, like the latest iteration of it. Got it. Got it. No, and that makes sense. So, and again, this isn't just fringe things this is very real uh that said it it just doesn't you know we're coming up bottom of the time and need to wrap up but it just doesn't seem like that's possible at all without some sort of global cataclysmic event that shatters the existing order uh you know if the existing order even if it is weak uh and not functioning as well as as it should it still str seems like to me it's it's still strong enough to reject uh, a great reset. It just seems. I mean, what do you think? Do you think it's they can possibly implement it uh, if things are seemingly going all right? Uh, what are your thoughts there? I think that's a really important question, and I think the fact that China is so on board with this. I do not remember all the Chinese communist leaders who were there, but I know that there were some top officials, especially from their, their communist bank and such. And if, you know, if, if they're the ones that are, that are really trying to drive this and they're the ones that are saying, well, you know what, the 21st century is gonna be the China century. We've got 1.3 billion people. We are the way that it's gonna be from now on. And um, I, I, I do worry that if, if, if it gets a lot of momentum from European countries who wanna kind of piggyback off China and then you get Russia and some other countries that are saying, well, yeah, let's just join them, that the, Amer the United States of America and the West in general could be almost outnumbered and that this could happen even if we aren't on board. So, I mean, I, I think it's really difficult to, to envision what can happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years with this. But the fact that they're kind of planting their flag now, and especially that they're planting it uh, during the midst of this pandemic, which they are trying to use as the as the, uh, the the event to uh, you know implement their their global order um, should definitely strike a little bit of fear in people. Oh, yeah, well, it's not fringe, no. No, definitely not. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. With that, uh, if people want to learn more about it, where should they go? So we've got a stopping socialism uh, project under the heartlandinstitute.org theheartlandinstitute.org and um, you know just we've got lots of resources on our website and I think people would learn a lot also by going to the World Economic Forum and just doing some research I mean I you know I, I've been trying to learn about this as much as I can there's a lot out there take some time take some uh, you know some energy but it's worthwhile definitely no thank you for that Chris and uh, I'd like to do also a special thanks uh, to for everybody who's listening and watching to Scott Ninsel. Uh he is the man behind the scenes making all of this possible and has just been doing a phenomenal job uh, and so again this is a, another episode of First Tuesday Conservatives uh, Countdown to the Election co-hosted by Alpha News and Charlemagne Institute, of which uh, I, Devin Foley, am the CEO. And we publish Intellectual Takeout as well as Chronicles Magazine. Uh, come to our website too, if you like, and become a member for just five bucks a month. You become a member, lots of other things, but you also get a 12 month subscription to Chronicles. Uh, and it is, it's very good and meaty, digs into a lot of topics like these. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you again, Chris, and I look forward to following your work as it develops. Thank you very much, appreciate it.